citizenship, human rights, and democracy. These are key elements to ensure sustainable development. And now I am pleased to invite to the stage Emmanuel Lutouzé, who has been a, a fighter for many years to promote uh, these elements in sustainable development through the use of new technologies, including AI. All right, so is it on? Okay, so, um, well, so good evening. I know it's late. Uh, it's been two uh, long days. So, um, well, I'll try to close uh, these very, uh, yeah, very interesting two days of, uh, of discussions and presentations by hopefully a presentation that will give you some perspectives and so like, you know, food for thoughts. Uh, obviously, I mean, you see the title, uh, it's, it's a very, very broad, very ambitious uh, title. I mean, it's not my title, that's the, you know, the topic I was asked uh, to talk about. So, what's next? So, artificial intelligence as a driver for sustainable and inclusive development towards the 2030 agenda. Um, so, this is sort of like a lifetime of work, so to speak. And so, I have basically 25 minutes um, to try and give you reference points, uh, maybe a sort of like a vision um, about those topics and to try and think and, 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 and work uh, towards uh, sustainable development. Uh, so I won't introduce myself. You can maybe see my bio in, uh, in um, either online or, or in, the, in the program. Uh, I will just say one thing is that I'm not a computer scientist. I'm not a data scientist by training. Uh, I'm a demographer uh, by training, so I've studied demography. And a lot of my work uh, and thinking is sort of yeah, informed uh, by my, my background as a demographer, uh, especially the fact that I like to think in long terms and in generational terms uh, and not in, in short terms. Um, so, yeah, so is the, yeah, okay. So I've been, um, yeah, as was introduced, so I've been lucky to be in this space for uh, the past decade. Um, so I, I joined um, so the past decade of the data revolution, so to speak, or the big data revolution, and increasingly it's called uh, AI, so we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, so it's been about 10 years of, of, of trying, of testing, of piloting, and we get to a point where people are uh, asking hard questions about privacy, as was discussed, about politics, uh, about imbalances of power, and so on and so forth. Um, and so... Over the past 10 years, there has been a maturation in the, in the, in the, in the, in the field. But now we're really asking, okay, what, what are we going to do with, um, with, with, with AI uh, in, in, uh, in, in particular? So just to give you a pointer, so I joined the space in 2010 when I joined UN Global Pulse. Um, and I worked on there for a year. And I wrote this report, Big Data for Development Challenges and Opportunities, in 2011. So it's been almost 10 years. Uh, when I look back, some things are still relevant, but th some things uh, I would write differently. Um, and I'll try to uh, give you my, my yeah, vision on, on, uh, on that. So AI uh, is pretty scary uh, to a lot of people. So there are lots of concerns, lots of fears about the end of work, about you know, biases, about algorithmic decision making, about robots taking over the world, and so on and so forth. Uh, when we live in pretty contentious, you know, complex times uh, with the rise of uh, sort of like Right, extreme right wing uh, like parties in, in many countries around the world. Uh, some of it is, seem, is is thought to be driven by social media. So let's say that there are yeah lots lots of of, of worries uh, about about um, about AI. But at the same time, if we look historically, so if we take a long term picture, so this is uh, if, if we think in 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 not years but decades or centuries, uh, and we think of the role of technology. I mean, I, you know, you've heard a lot of new technology is neutral, it can be used for good or bad. Uh, overall, if we look at the long run, uh, I mean, techn technology has led to major advances in, in, uh, in human conditions. I mean, so Ronald Lee uh, was my PhD advisor. I mean, he's still alive, but um, he's no longer my PhD advisor. And so he, he, he worked uh, on, a lot on the demographic transition, which is sort of a, a contemporary with the Industrial Revolution. And basically, I think th this sentence says a lot, that before the start of the demographic transition or the Industrial Revolution, 
basically a life was pretty tough for a lot of people. So you can think of life expectancy, living standards. And over the past 200 years, there has been a very large, uh, quick uptake in living standards. And so this is, and a lot of that, of course, was driven by technology. So this is not to say, of course, that technology is, you know, that things are smoothless or easy uh, and that technology is your friend. I mean, technology can be extremely uh, harmful, but overall, I think we're, we're better off uh, using uh, technology. At the same time, uh, we live in a world, as I said, which is pretty complicated. Uh, I mean, democracy is, uh, is not like sort of like spreading around the world, also historically, but we know that it's uh, also very fragile. Um, and so this uh, UNDP report just came out that underlines all the inequalities, uh, all the sources, features, drivers of various forms of inequalities around the world. So the point here is also to say that we don't live in this like very rosy world that AI is going to disrupt. I mean, the world is a pretty tough place. We're, we're making progress. We've made some progress on extreme poverty, uh, but still there is a lot of room for improvement. Um, and I think that uh, data and, 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 and AI can actually, uh, can actually help under certain conditions. And so maybe one thing that I think is important to, to understand is that um, so we've moved, we've talked a lot about big data, data AI, so, and, and not always uh, on very like firm conceptual uh, basis or, or, or ground, but in a nutshell, something, so the previous presentation was talking about culture, um, and I think what is important to understand for starters is that, so when we talk about big data and AI, it's not just about large uh, data sets. Um, so I, I take this more uh, systemic perspective uh, on AI, which is to say that, um, so big data is better understood as an ecosystem, uh, as, a, as a phenomenon, the same way open data is a phenomenon, it's an ecosystem. And so at the center of this ecosystem, you have the crumbs, so those digital crumbs that we leave behind. So the, the sort of like the big data, the large data set, so credit card transactions, cell phone records, social media data, easy passes, or anything that leaves a digital trace. Around that, you have capacities, human capacities, to make sense of the data uh, and to use it for good or bad. But this is also uh, like critical to to make big data and AI what, what they are. I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. And then last, uh, but fundamentally, uh, there is the issue of community and culture. So I will talk about what I think could be a healthy data culture uh, in, in, a, in a few minutes. Um, but I think it's very important to think in this sort of like systems kind of, um, of, uh, of way as opposed to just focusing on, on just, uh, just the data. So these data, have been used, the sort of new digital breadcrumbs, they have been used for about 10 years pretty extensively uh, through machine learning approaches, so the big data capacities, by members of the big data community uh, to, for example, estimate development indicators from those digital breadcrumbs. So this is a, a comic strip that I, that I did, so speaking of, I don't know, culture and, um, so this is a, a comic strip that I did about almost eight years ago to explain how you can um, estimate development indicators such as poverty or such as population density or inequality using cell phone activity. So I don't have time to explain like how this works, but the gist of it is that you can find systematic correlations between the way a given population uses their cell phones and other features of these populations, such as their age structure, such as their wealth, the level of wealth, and we, and, and these, these algorithms, these machines, are able to learn how to connect the inputs and, and, the, and the outputs. And so this has been key in the field. Like people have realized, oh, there's a lot we can do. We can maybe fill some data gaps using those approaches, so those machine learning approaches. So I'm really emphasizing the, the, the aspect of learning because as you'll see at the end, the, so like the main argument that I want to make is that uh, we have, as human societies, we have to become better at learning. So it's not just machine learning, it's also human learning um, that needs to be strengthened. So this is another short um, comic, well, cartoon that I did uh, at Eurostat, actually, uh, during a live debate, so six months ago, um, which is to like bring a sort of a, a grain of salt in the argument that the main way in which the data revolution is going to help human progress is by improving measurement. 
So you hear a lot about measuring the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and that with the data revolution, we're going to get better at measuring the SDGs, and that somehow there will be a causal impact on what is being measured. But, but historically, it's sort of true that measurement and development tend to go hand in hand. However, we know that there are lots of things that are measured and no action is taken on the basis of measurement because of politics, because of psychology, because of many things. Um, and so this little gentleman is saying, well, the data revolution is here uh, and it's amazing. We can measure your level of poverty in real time, etc. Uh, but the bad news is that we still can't do uh, anything about it. And so this is not to say that measurement is useless, but it is to point out that it's um, not sufficient. And indeed, so this is just a, a small exercise that we did. If you look at the correlation across country uh, between the, the quality of statistics here on the, on the x-axis and, and the level of development on the y-axis here captured by GDP per capita, you see it's, it's pretty scattered. So you don't see this sort of like nice 45 degree line where as statistics get better, uh, countries are, are richer. So let's say it's, it's, um, it's, it's the, the relationship between measurement and development is, 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 is complex. So today's technology, or rather tomorrow's technology, is AI. And so what is the, um, the gist of AI? What is, what, what is novel about like today's AI and tomorrow's AI? And can we learn uh, from, from, from AI? Can we use AI and, and, and how can we do so? So um, I'm not gonna, uh, I assume that a lot of you are familiar with, with AI. So I won't spend too much time uh, explaining so like the gist of AI, but only to say that um, basically AI are very good are very good at, at achieving a stated goal by learning through data and through a lot of feedback loops um, and, and by being rewarded or penalized if they get the, the result wrong, so right or wrong. So in the case of, uh, of the picture on the, on the, on the left hand, on the right hand side, so the AI here will be asked, is it a city or a beach? And at first, it doesn't know between the city or whether it's a city or a beach. And so it's through a lot of feedbacks and through human inputs that it's going to learn how to distinguish a city or a beach. The same then goes with a cat or a dog and so on and so forth. Likewise, a driverless car is going to become very good at driving, at taking you in 10 years probably to the airport without... Uh, actually needing a driver, so it won't take two hours to go to the, to the airport, uh, but it will take fewer hours because there will be fewer accidents, for instance. And it, it's, it, it's not coded, so it, it's learned through a lot of, of uh, feedback loops. And it's very good. It is very good at understanding what helps it get uh, the right result. And so the big question that I'm and the, so like one proposition, a vision that I'm, I'm trying to put forth with others and that we're trying to test and implement is what would a human AI look like and what would it take? So what would be a human AI? So a human AI is not a nice AI, okay? It's not, it's not even, it's broader than human-centered AI. It is not AI done in a human way. It is, think of it as we would all be in a sort of like giant human machine like system. And we would use AI both as an inspiration for driving our societies, especially for making public decisions. So we would use AI as an inspiration with this idea of feedback loops and learning. And we would use AI as an instrument so it's twofold. The notion of this human AI is twofold. It is about using AI as an inspiration to do more of what works, to do more of what leads to the good result, to identify through data and feedback loops what you should do more of and what you should do less of. And at times, to also use AI as an instrument in the process. So hopefully this will become clear or clearer um, in the next few slides what this AI, human AI is, could be, 
what it will take. So maybe to shed some additional light. Um, so this notion of a human AI is fundamentally a learning adaptive system. It is a society that learns from data. So it is a society that is able to, to adjust, that understands um, what is causing civil war, for instance, that understands how you can uh, improve educational outcomes in children, and that does that uh, through data. And so it's, it is adaptive. Depending on conditions, it can, it can change while retaining its main, its main functions. Um, a society that is not able to learn that way is a society or a system that is more likely to break. And here, breaking can mean having a civil conflict, for example. So if you don't have in societies these kinds of feedback loops and systems, if you don't learn, then at some point the system reach, reaches uh, a point where it sort of breaks or, Im or implodes. So I do think fundamentally that human development, this complex you know, system, this complex phenomenon, is human learning. So that human development happens by human learning, but that it is also fundamentally human learning. So I'm in my early 40s, um, so I grew up you know, at the back of a car without a seat belt, like sleeping, etc. Cetera, et cetera. I'm still alive, I'm not really sure how. Uh, but there are those things that today look crazy to us that our parents did and then our grandparents did. And today, you, saw, you see some of those pictures. Um, some of those on the left-hand side seem today crazy to us. Spanking kids, not everybody agrees that it's crazy. I think it's crazy. Uh, but not everybody agrees. So there are still like contentious questions. My hypothesis is that single-use plastic will look crazy to our children, that there are lots of things that we do today that where our children, if we think in generational terms, will go back and look at and say, wow, like how on earth did you do that? And sometimes it's because we don't have the data, okay? But very often it's because of a lack of culture. So it's that the data has not filtered into culture, that we have not learned um, to uh, what is actually what should be done and what should not be done. And so if you think of this, of this like, system where more public decisions would be taken on the basis of evidence, Okay, where we would learn what works, what doesn't work, and we do more of what works, and we because it's recognized, because it's valued, because it's rewarded, and we do less of what leads to bad results. So why is it not really happening? What are the challenges, the risks, and the requirements for this sort of like human artificial intelligence system? Well, first is, first is as was. Um, pointed out in the previous uh, presentation and, and others, it's the lack of data access, it's the lack of data culture also, um, it's the lack of capacities in many countries uh, to actually make sense of the data, to actually access, analyze, in particular, private sector data that could help us understand human ecosystems uh, in much, much finer ways. The second reason is also that like powerful, so it's a very political argument, is that powerful elites that benefit from the status quo have very little to no incentive for systems to be more efficient, for systems to be, to be fairer, uh, for, 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 for public decisions to be more uh, taken on the, basic, on the basis of facts. Um, so it's all, things are going, doing, going, well, going that well for them. Um, and so this would lead to major political disruption. Uh, if pol like public policies were taken on the basis of facts, if corrupt politicians could be actually held to account systematically. So you have a lot of politicians who are not really in favor um, of actually uh, such a system. There is also the fact that I think is central, which is for such a system to work, you need to agree on some basic, fa on some basic facts. You need to be able to communicate. You, be, you need to be able to discuss, like to compromise. Um, so it's like democracy as government by discussion. Today, 
Um, I'm not really sure whether it's really worse than 50 years ago, but we seem to be living more and more and more in bubbles, whether they are digital or analog. If someone disagrees with you, they are stupid. They are like jerks. They are morons. Uh, and we know that it's not by telling people climate change is real. If you don't believe in climate change, you're stupid. It's not how you make them change their mind. So I think for this kind of like feedback loops to function, there needs to be also like some respect uh, between, uh, between people, and I think we're missing uh, increasingly um, a lot of that. And also, from psychology, we know that it's hard, which is sort of like, you know, related to the previous argument, it's hard to make, to, so that, to make people change their mind. There are things that are very deeply related to our identity, and so giving away uh, something from our identity is often very, very painful. Um, and we have other reasons why we have this uh, other, you know, uh, piece of pie. Even if we know that it's not rational that we should not eat the, this fifth piece of pie, if we like it, um, well, we're going to have another one. So there are other, um, there are other variables in, in the calculus uh, of our decisions. And then, of course, one of the risks is, is that such a system where you would have so those data, so like driven informed feedback loops, can become ex too extreme. It can become so like Orwellian. Uh, of course, you can think of uh, you know credit score. Uh, if everybody has a credit score or has a, has a social score based on how well they behave, etc., then it becomes a pretty horrible society. So there's also a limit uh, beyond which this system, uh, I think, should not go. And so. Uh, but at the same time, as I said in the second slide, it's not like we live in, a, in an unbiased, uh, amazing world today without AI and, and, and without technology in, in, in many of our, of our public decision making. And so there is this argument, you can agree, disagree, but it's a good basis for discussion, about whether algorithms are more biased or less biased. But actually the question is, is it easier to fix the bias in an algorithm than it is to fix a bias in people? I mean, a lot of people are racist. Uh, judges, it's a common argument, well-known fact. Judges, you don't get the same sentence for the same exact offense, whether you are in front of the judge before lunch or after lunch, because humans get hungry. Uh, and algorithms don't get hungry. And so um, I really think that uh, algorithms can help uh, uncover, fix some biases, uh, but that humans should sort of be kept uh, in, in, in the loop. And that happens through regulation, but not just through regulation. There's a lot of work also in terms of like building the right culture, building the right levels of literacy about data, which I will uh, get to. So now I'm in the last sort of like, yeah, the last, uh, the last mile. I'm trying to sort of you know, bring things together. So how can we use data, algorithms, so artificial intelligence? So here I'm, I'm really talking about using. So it's not just the inspiration. It's about using. How can we tap into the power of data? And a lot of it is private sector data in a way that does not infringe on individual privacy, that does not put people at risk in ways that do not enhance rather than reduce inequalities, inequities, and so on and so forth. Well, nobody has figured it out, okay? So it's a very, very hard problem. And so there are different models of so-called private data sharing. So how can we tap into the data of Telefonica, of BBVA, of Facebook, of you know, whatever, to try and understand, to respond to epidemiology crisis, uh, to understand crime dynamics, and so on and so forth. There are lots, there is a lot of wealth in these data sets, but how can we tap into them at scale systematically? That's, in terms of what's next, that's one of the key things of what's next. How can we do that? So, I think, with others, that one way is this approach that we've been promoting for a couple of years uh, called the open algorithms uh, approach, so the OPAL approach. I will show you some slides about how it works. But fundamentally, the gist of it is that it's not the data that goes to the algorithm or go to the algorithms, it's the algorithms that go to the data. Okay, so it's a question and answer mechanism. So here you see in the top right corner, you see it's a, it's a question and answer mechanism. And we think that this way of tapping into private data is both more scalable across industries and geographies and is 
safer than other ways of sharing data. The worst way you can share private data is actually by you know, putting it on a, on a USB stick or a CD-ROM and just you know, sending it around saying, be careful. Okay? And that was done a couple of years ago, and it's a bad idea. And so the open algorithms approach is really anchored in reflective of uh, and trying to promote this vision of a human AI. Okay, it may, see, it may seem a bit like disjointed, uh, but I, 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 hopefully I, I'm, I will manage to convince you that what this system does is trying to put in place systems and standards to implement this vision of a human AI uh, at, at scale. So the inspiration is that you would have, you would be able to get insights, to get indicators, to get statistics, to get evidence from data about a whole range of social questions. You would be able to measure the SDGs using private sector data uh, at scale. You would be able to do monitoring and evaluation of programs using private sector data. So you would be much more able to understand what works, what doesn't work for a given uh, objective and to adjust uh, accordingly. So here, we're doing this as you will see in Senegal and Colombia, and it's, it's working, like it's not just uh, like a fantasy or, or you know, a dream, it's, it's, we have a prototype that works. And here we're working with telecom operators, and so we are asking questions like what is the population density right now in almost real time? What is the poverty level in these different, different regions in, in real time? And so this is sort of like the technological part. All, everything, of course, happens on the servers, behind the firewalls of the companies. No data ever leave the servers of the company. Um, and it's, so it's not only anonymized or more specifically or accurately pseudonymized, uh, it's also aggregated to a level uh, that is deemed safe. So it's not individual data. So what comes out of the system are statistics. Okay, and they feed into the, so like, the human AI system. We also have governance standards. People have to be able to say what they care about, what topic they want to be uh, analyzed. They have to be able to say, this algorithm seems biased. There needs to be systems, standards in place, such that there can be auditability, accountability, and so on and so forth. And to date, in terms of what's next, that does not exist. There are lots of principles, uh, but it does not exist, and it's not implemented uh, at scale by, by any stretch of the imagination. So we're trying to put in place those systems and, and, and standards. And so this is where we are. So I mentioned it was operational. So it's been tested in Senegal and Colombia since 2017. So I've been directing uh, this project since 2017. So it's a project that involves the MIT Media Lab, Imperial College London, the World Economic Forum, um, Orange, so Orange, the uh, French telecom company, um, uh, Telefonica, and, uh, and, other, uh, and other partners. And so and in the next phase, we want to scale to new industries. So right now, we've been working with banks, sorry, with telecom data. Next, we'd like to also work with bank data, with credit card data, with uh, uh, like, you know, potentially insurance uh, data, and so on and so forth. And in, in the end, the vision is that in thinking 20 years, or 30 years, or 50 years, you would have a sort of like a, a weather map of how societies are doing, and you would be able to understand in much more, uh, at, at much finer levels uh, of, of complexity, what's happening in, in your societies by tapping into these, these data sets in a way that is privacy uh, preserving. And so here, and I have three more slides, four maybe. So I wanna make clear that the, 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 this vision of a human AI is not, a, is not like a techno-utopian where you know, machines are gonna be in charge and algorithms know better, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's really about empowerment. It's really about empowering people to, uh, to use data. It's, it's both about giving them the incentive. It's about convincing them, us, data subjects, that we are better off and we will be better off if we agree to pool our data together in a safe way to improve public policy making. Okay? And there needs to be in place a whole governance. There needs to be in place rights that are enforceable, data rights. People needs to have, need to have also the means 
of using the data. So we'll, it will take a lot of work, and then I will end with some like, concrete considerations. But it is, it is a vision. We agree to share our money in banks. Okay? It may sound crazy if you think about it. You have cash, and you decide to go to the bank, and you give it to the bank. And how can you be sure that you're going to get it back? Because you trust the system, because there are regulations in place, because there are systems in place. And so I and we think that uh, the same could, be, could work with data, where we would pool our data, and there would be a system that makes us feel safe about doing that, and that would feed a better human AI uh, system. And so key, and it's, it, it is a UNESCO uh, conference, so of course, uh, literacy, learning, and I will close with that in two minutes, so I will be two minutes over time. Is, so this question of literacy, the question of data literacy has become central. Um, so since we're in Brazil, the starting point for my work and thinking around literacy was actually Claude Lévi-Strauss, and also because I'm French, as you can hear. And so um, working on literacy Claude Lévi in Brazil, Claude Lévi-Strauss uh, said in the 50s and 60s, actually, historically, literacy was not really about empowerment. It was a means of control by the elites, because if you have an illiterate citizenry, then you cannot organize an army, you cannot organize an economy, you cannot organize, you cannot um, get taxes, okay? And so it's only when literacy became very broad, uh, when beyond the ability to read and write, that it became and it becomes a force of enlightenment and empowerment. And I think the same arguments apply to data literacy. If data literacy is only about um, training coders, then they can do horrible things, all right? So it's not about uh, being able to code, it's not about being a, a good data cruncher. Being data literate is about being literate in a new era. It's about being literate in the age of, um, of data. And so we try to bring this approach to a lot of different activities that we do, uh, but I think it's critical that we understand that the kids of today have to be not just trained about AI, etc. They have to be made aware, they have to be made conscious uh, of the value, the wealth, and the power uh, of these data and how they could be used in one generation for, um, for the greater good. And so, well, you can look on our website just some examples of work that we try to do in Latin America, for instance, so as DataPub with Opal and others, so this sort of like alliance, um, and we try to put in practice some of those, some of this vision, we try to promote it uh, through different works uh, in, uh, in, the, in, in the region, including with, um, with, with CETIC. So, last word, last slide. So what's next? Big data, AI, SDGs. So it's complicated, all right? It's, very, it's, very, it's a very, very complex topic. Um, I'm, I'm a sort of like cautious optimist. Uh, I don't want to be cynical uh, about technology and AI. It's very easy to say that AI is horrible, that it leads to biases, etc. Sometimes I think, like, look at the state of the world. Like, are you happy with the state of the world? I'm not very happy with the state of the world. And so I think AI and technology can make things worse, definitely but I think they can also make things much better. So the question is, sort of like, who wins? And so if we are together, and the next generation in particular, if we are to use uh, or to leverage the power of both, let's say, the principles of artificial intelligence and the tools of, art of artificial intelligence, then I think we can be, and our children can be much better off and make very more rational, fact-based uh, decisions. And for that, and this is the end, I think we need, as I've tried to explain or highlight, um, we need new technological standards and systems, we need new governance standards and systems, and we need also new cultural standards, a sort of like, you know, uh, a liking for facts, for example. Uh, and that, I believe, will lead to this sort of future human AI societies that will be fundamentally learning um, societies. Thank you.